Welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about technologies, projects and people driving decentralization and the blockchain revolution. I'm Friederike Ernst and today I'm speaking with Mona Elisa, who is the founder of Enzyme Finance and the CEO of Avantgarde Finance. Um, and Enzyme is a protocol for on-chain asset management and delegating this trustlessly to other parties. And we will go um, into detail in just a bit. But um, before, before we do, let me tell you about our sponsors this week. Our first sponsor is Teddy Ho. Teddy Ho is redefining the wallet as a public good. You can think of it as a community-owned alternative to MetaMask. With Teddy Ho, you can enter the metaverse with Web3 wallet that's fully community-owned and operated, and it's the first wallet that is also a DAO. Teddy Ho's commitment to community ownership and public good stretches beyond the wallet. In January, they became the first sponsor of EtherJS, um, an open source JavaScript library helping developers connect to Ethereum. And they recently announced that um, they are committing 2.5% of their total token supply to Gitcoin Aqueduct. Head over to tellyho.cash to try um, the Tellyho Community Edition and play around with its feature um, before its upcoming launch. Stake Wallet is our other sponsor today. Um, Stake Wallet is a multi chain mobile wallet that puts the power of Web3 at your fingertips. In just three taps, you can stake and manage your assets on over 22 built-in protocols, including all major EVMs, Layer 2s, and non-EVMs like Cosmos, Solana, Nier, and more. Stake Wallet abstracts away all complexity while being fully self-custodial, meaning getting yield on your crypto has never been so easy and secure. Stake Wallet also has multi-chain NFT support, and you can view all of your NFTs in one place. And um, you can flex your cleaners NFT by setting it up as your app background. Don't forget to check out the explore section in the app for your daily fix of the hottest D apps, deals and news across chains. And this summer Stake Wallet is upgrading um, to provide you with even more functionality and to highlight their transformation. Um, it will be renamed to Omni, the next generation super wallet. Join thousands of users on this next generation wallet by downloading it today on iOS or Android at stakewallet.fi. And stake wallet is spelled like the meat. Okay, Mona, <laughs> it's a pleasure to have you on again after all this time. Pleasure to be back. Thanks for having me, Frederica. I recently listened um, to the episode you recorded ages ago. Um, it, it must have been late 2016 or early 2017. Um, back then you came on with your then co-founder, um, Ratu Trinkler, um, and most of the episode actually revolved around Polkadot and the white paper that had been published in the weeks prior. So obviously lots of things have changed. Um, you're now built on Ethereum and Polygon, not Polkadot. Rito has disappeared. You've changed your name. <laughs> so t tell, uh, tell us about the, the last five and a half years. Well, the protocol has changed its name. My name is the same. <laughs> oh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> back then, you, you guys were called Melon. Yes, exactly. Yeah. 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 So, oh, God, it does feel like ages ago since I was, uh, I was here. Um, and certainly it was very different times. I mean, um, it, you know, it was uh, first, it, you know, very, very kind of le less experienced founder, I guess. Uh, we were, um, we got into a phase where we were, um, uh, Gavin and Yuta were advisors to our, our company, uh, Melonport, that built Melon V1. Um, and uh, we were we were very close to them, still are uh, close to them. Um, and at a point, at a point, we were just uh, 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 talking about Polkadot and Melon, now Enzyme, and um, we we got excited about kind of possibility, future possibilities. And uh, I think it was Gavin that suggested that we consider doing a joint token sale. And for a while, that um, idea persisted. Um, but actually, a few months in, we decided that it would maybe um, make more sense to do our token generation events in a in a in a separate and more independent way. Um, we we never actually committed to building on Polkadot back then because things were so early. I mean, it hadn't even really been built. We just had a white paper at the time, um, and our intention was there, you know, to see how things developed and to make sure that it was going to be. 
um, a chain that we could build on and that had all the infrastructure that we would need. But um, to this day, we've actually been quite slow to ra- roll out on other chains. Um, we Even Polygon uh, deployment that we recently did, I think it was in April, May, it started off actually as an experiment. <laughs> we were uh, at an offsite and we just had a free day of, of, of hacking and a few of the devs got together and said, let's just try to deploy Enzyme on Polygon. And um, unlike many other protocols, Enzyme is, is, a, is, a, is a complex protocol. It's made of 25 contracts. It has um, a very complicated subgraph infrastructure that underpins it. So we, we run seven subgraphs to um, collect all the data emitted. We have uh, a dependency on, um, on Chainlink for price feeds so that we can give uh, our users real-time uh, historical reporting. And um, and yeah, and this this kind of experiment just kind of yeah got some momentum. And before we knew it, we were inserting it quickly into our product roadmap and making it into a deployment. But yeah, actually, usually we're much more uh, slow and cautious when we deploy on on new chains. And and we're definitely looking still at the Polkadot ecosystem with special interest in what Akala is doing and what Moonbeam is doing. Uh, speaking to those teams very closely, but still, I would say um, not quite at a point where we're, we, you know, we, we've um, decided on a time or, or a commitment to deploy anything yet. Why did you end up um, changing your name from Melon to Enzyme? Don't get me wrong. I think Enzyme is a much better name. But, uh... I still miss <laughs> Melon, actually. But yeah, it wasn't... Um, so, so in the middle of the bear market, the last bear market, uh, we were approached by uh, BNY Mellon, um, uh, which is a large uh, fund administrator in the U.S. For those who don't know, and um, even though the, the spelling, even though their full name is BNY Mellon, spelt with double L, um, they felt that um, we were um, uh, in, infringing on their trademark. Um, so we. Um, we tried to push back and um, every single legal letter that we responded to them with was costing us um, sort of, uh, you know, five fig- five figures in terms of legal fees. Um, and we felt that we, we had a strong case, but uh, we felt that we would be outspent in the courts if we persisted it. And because of the bear market situation and because we were actually caught on, um, on a pretty bad treasury management, I would say, in the last bear market, we decided to preserve our capital and um, take the opportunity to rebrand actually in the market, um, to take an opportunity to rebrand and freshen things up a little bit as well. Cool. Um, so tell us about um, the vision for Enzyme from the get-go. Has it changed over the years? Yeah, I think it, it hasn't really changed. I, I, I think um, it's mostly, uh, it's, it's actually stayed very consistent. I would say that there's a slight subtle difference between the vision behind Enzyme and Avantgarde, which is the company building on Enzyme today. Um, in, in terms of, of, of Enzyme's vision, I think the, the idea has always been to be giving um, simplicity, simplicity, transparency to investors by, by enabling them to have uh, you know, three key things. One is transparency. Um, we've seen with recent market events, um, you know, what happens when there's opacity in the financial markets and uh, the contagion impact that can happen when you don't understand the risks or the leverage or the or, or you can't see through the lies that certain counterparties are telling you. Um, another aspect that we felt very strongly about was that people having control of their own assets through non-custodial uh, solutions. So we don't actually advocate that non-custodial is good for everybody. I think that's a personal user choice, but I think having the option um, to, to, to have custody of your own assets and control of your own assets should always be a possibility. And that has always been part of the vision. And then last but not least, we were quite excited and still are about decentralized systems, uh, decentralized governance systems versus centralized single points of failure. Um, and again, just this week, we've seen um, an interesting story in the Financial Times where the London Metal Exchange just on its own decided to cancel, I think, six or seven hours worth of trades just because they were afraid people couldn't make margin requirements. And this was just like, an, it was actually, they, they think it's an illegal decision that was made by a centralized um, single point, you know, single single kind of party. 
they rolled back transactions and uh, they caused, I think, uh, they're being sued for $456 million um, in losses that they caused. And, um, you know, who, who, who decided that that was okay? Uh, that decision was out of their remit. Um, you know, what conflicts of interest did they have? Um, in making that decision, you know, obviously they would have been the, the worse off party if the margin payments couldn't have been made. Um, and so, you know, we, we have always believed that, that's just one recent example, but we've always believed that decentralized governance, if done right, and we've obviously um, seen, you know, some, some growing pains with that. And, but if done right, we, we believe that it can bring some balance and some objectivity to the way decisions are made. And you guys... Um you're very much at the forefront of decentralized governance. So I think you you were one of the first projects to have fully decentralized. And I want to talk about this a little bit later in the episode. Um, but before that, let's um, let's maybe talk about um, what the protocol offers to users. So say um, I am a, a retail investor and I hold uh, crypto assets um, in, I self-custody them um, it, in a way um, Enzyme Finance enables me to delegate the active management of um, those assets to someone else, right? So, so the the power of Enzyme is that you can. Um, so we I, we we didn't actually talk about the trustless aspect. That's um, uh, a, another actually very key principle around the Enzyme vision is 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 keeping this trustless relationship between investment manager and investor. And um, this is something that over time we've actually um, has slowed us down and actually created a lot more work for us. But we've been very passionate about that um, value or that, that vision that we want to be able to automate that. Um, you know, in traditional finance, you need financial intermediaries to give trust between the different counterparties and in a traditional fund or Uh, any financial product, you would typically have a custodian, a fund administrator, an auditor, etc. Those those people play the role of making sure that the investor is or the manager is managing the funds in a way that was promised to the investor. And we believe that you can do away with all of those financial intermediaries through just using smart contracts. And that's how we've always built Enzyme with this in mind. And it becomes very challenging. Um, the more complex DeFi becomes, Uh, the more types of assets and the more types of standards that we, we see, it becomes more and more difficult to adhere to those uh, promises. But we have always um, avoided taking the shortcuts to to not compromise on those promises. Today and hopefully, you know, for years to come, it will always be possible for an investor to invest in an enzyme vault, um, in, a, in a, any kind of uh, financial product built on enzyme with the full knowledge that the manager can only behave in certain ways. Um, for example, only interact with certain protocols or only interact with certain assets or not act with certain or not trade against certain assets, not trade with certain protocols. Um, you can also have um, prohibit prohibitations like or, or stop losses uh, embedded in the smart contracts if, if for example, um, somebody use, loses five or ten percent in trading slippage over a very short trading period. Um, you know, you can actually pause their restrictions, trading restrictions, until the 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 oh, the, the the sort of board or the I, I say board, but typically in in this space we 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 refer to we we think it's um, uh, uh, you know there's a manager, but there's also like a group of people who own the vault or own the the product and, and and govern that product, and usually that's done through a higher layer, uh, um, the, the most common one we see is with the Gnosis safe. Um, and they, these people can like review, okay, well, why did he breach the, the, the trading slippage or why did she breach trading slippage? Was it a valid reason or were they trying to do something inappropriate, malicious, and then, and then kind of reassess whether they want to give back the permissions. So trading still possible at the, at, the, at, the, at the safe level, but temporarily gets halted. And so before you invest, you can see upfront you know, what you're getting into, what the risks are, what you are and are allowed to do, um, you know, is it, it sometimes could be comforting to know that if you're investing in a in a in a yield vault uh, with which is not allowed to take any leverage, for example, because you're not comfortable with leverage or has a maximum leverage ratio. This is something that, you know, suits your particular risk profile. 
um, and you might want to protect against, um, you know, for example, assets below a certain liquidity being touched or being traded um, in a vault so that you know that if you redeem, because you can always have the right to redeem, you will always be able to find liquidity in the underlying assets. So th there's a, as a bunch of different protections. Um, we talked just now about the asset management um, policies in particular, but there's even um, protections uh, thought about and built in at a governance layer. So with t traditional financial systems, if, uh, if an update or an upgrade is pushed, it's usually forced on you. With Enzyme, if, you, you know, if we decide to upgrade from V4 to V5, um, all we do is uh, signal an upgrade, but it's up to the vault managers to actually opt into the upgrade. Um, and in order to protect investors, maybe they don't want to do this upgrade. Maybe the upgrade is going to in include changes that they don't like, increased fees or uh, change of risk management policies. There's always a seven day cool down period where they're notified about any changes up front and that they have um, a possibility to opt out within a seven day period before they're forced into this new paradigm. So you see everywhere we worked, um, we've tried to think about how to preserve that um, trustless relationship. There's a lot to unpack here. Obviously lots of thought um, has gone into the system. Maybe let's stay with um, the retail customer, the user um, for, for a bit. So. I mean, obviously, your your background um, is in trading. You were a Goldman Sachs star trader for in your previous life. So um, obviously, to you, all these investment vehicles, they're not scary because you understand them. Um, what about so basically, as someone who's not um, deeply knowledgeable um, about um, how financial instruments work? Um, how do I decide which vault to um, buy into? Yeah, I mean, I think traditionally this is something um, Enzyme hasn't been able to display very well. Um, and what's interesting is like Enzyme is really all about the core uh, infrastructure. Um, it, you know, we think about it sometimes as an operating system for asset management, something that enables you to build any asset management products on top of it in a trustless decentralized way but um we they've never really uh, enzyme the council around enzyme have never been particularly um concerned or focused on the user experience or making investment or even the products that are built on enzyme these are all built by third parties after we decentralized enzyme uh, melon slash uh, enzyme we um, a few months later we you know we formed avant-garde finance and avant-garde finance is um vision has been much more about um, enabling. So basically, um, you know, sure, we have the infrastructure now to build products easily, but what do you need to think of outside of the code? Um, and then um, education and discovery. So like if you're a retail investor coming into the platform right now, it's very overwhelming. There's hundreds and thousands of vaults. <laughs> and uh, yeah, sure, we have filters and we have data and we have, uh, uh, um, we're, we're about to roll out APIs so you can filter that data. But, you know, it's really not an experience for uh, a retail person coming in. And so Avantgarde is, is much more focused now on how to filter uh, the different vaults uh, or how to display the different vaults, how to categorize, how to educate around the risks of the different vaults. Um, and how to make accessing them uh, confidently much easier. Do you expect that parties to kind of build um, retail user centric front ends to this, maybe even with like a rating system or recommendations or approved by this uh, by a committee or something that basically that that kind of gives the user m more to go on? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, we um, we have been in some discussions with people who want to build that, and also we have um, been uh, beta testing um, a white label for Enzyme, which should make it much easier for people to display the vaults they want to display on their interface um, and give their own recommendations through their own branded company or through their own branded, could be either their own products or the products of others. Um, and this, I think, will be a really interesting stepping stone towards um, making 
bringing more transparency and uh, awareness around suitable investments for different people. Okay, cool. Yeah, that that makes lots of sense. Um, so let's let's um, stick with um, the investor for one more second. So um, I, I I have decided on a vault and I have invested in it in some sort of asset. Um, how do you make sure that I can always redeem? Because obviously the vault manager is allowed to kind of undertake certain actions on that. So do I need to give a heads up that I want to redeem or how is liquidity handled? We try to flag up front on the interface which vaults are 24-7 redeemable and which vaults might not be 24-7 redeemable. In the past, they've all been 24-7 redeemable, but as um, the complexity of DeFi has increased over the last year or two, um, we've seen new types of um, non-fungible or illiquid positions come into play like NFTs or like um, you know, when you borrow or when you when you uh, when you borrow on Aave or Compound or when you create a CDP, um, you're not always getting back a divisible ERC20 token, which can be redeemable at all times. So this has added um, this added complexity, and we we saw a lot of demand for these products, so we couldn't completely ignore them. Um, but ultimately, these the, the 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 use of these products does negate a little bit on the twenty four seven redeemability because, of course, if everybody wants to redeem at once, and um, the the vault is tied up a hundred percent in the borrowing, there's no way to force the unwind of that position in order to be able to redeem it. So. Um, so we we try to flag on the front end which ones are twenty four seven redeemable, and the way that you can guarantee to the investors that that twenty four seven redeemable is there is a policy that says that this vault is not allowed to interact with any external positions, uh, external positions being these more complicated, um, less liquid types of positions. Then there is another type of vault which is allowed to interact with external positions. Um, but we flag in our documentation and we're trying to make it clearer on our interface as well that these require this these kind of vaults require different level of trust assumptions. So typically you might require um, maybe a legal terms and conditions. You might want to know who your manager is, whereas in the other case you might not care because you have 24-7 redeemability full control. Um, so so we we have actually now started to think about enzyme. It's highly customizable, customizable, highly configurable, um, and we provide templates for people to create different types of vaults with different trust models associated with them. That makes a lot of sense. Um, so, if if I invested, say Ether, um, I might not get you know Ether back. I might get like some collection of um, ERC twenty tokens. When I redeem, right? So I, I there's no way to kind of just cash out in the whatever. Actually, uh, there is a way. So so um, when manager is um, a manager can uh, can can give his or her investors the, the option to redeem in a single asset or several single assets. Um, they just have to go to the settings page and say, okay, I want to make uh, ETH a redeemable asset, and they can also configure that uh, they can put a cap, you know, because. You don't want all the ETH to be drained without rebalancing the portfolio. So you can say, I'll allow um, up to 10% of the AUM to be redeemed in, in ETH um, if, that's, if, if that's something that the investor wants. But then they, there's a, a period of time which allows them to rebalance the portfolio. Then they can re, you know, go to their settings again and put a new rule that says you know, a single asset redemption is possible. Um, so again, we leave that up to the manager. Um, but the default, and as long as you're invested in one of these vaults, which is 24-7 redeemable, the default is that you get a slice of your assets back, uh, the underlying assets back. Do you have any idea um, what kind of market segment um, the user of this um, is? So basically, what kind of people... Um, I mean, because you kind of you have to know your way around DeFi, at least a reasonable amount to kind of say, uh, to specify... Um, what kind of protocols you're comfortable with and uh, what kind of policies um, you would like to have your vault manager adhere to. Um, so what, what, who are your users? Yeah, I mean, I think that the, the, the type of users that we tend to attract are typically, um, um, it's, it's quite broad-based, to be honest, because there are so many different things you can build on Enzyme. 
one use case of what we originally set out to build was for for the hedge fund use case and um um we saw a lot of interest in that but also a lot of fear and this kind of hindered growth for a while and the fear came from you know hedge fund law is very complicated am i doing something wrong if i raise money if i market the fund and there was just too much um complication and lack of clarity around the regulations so we 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 saw that growth somewhat stunted and that's something that we as avant-garde finance not as enzyme have been researching in a lot of detail to be able to provide um you know more like more advice and more solutions around that to prevent you know this 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 technology which offers huge amount of automation and lowers barriers to entry and really you know everybody including the ha- ha- regulator should be celebrating this really because it gives transparency it gives control um if if the regulator's job and mission is to protect the investor that's exactly what enzyme was built to do um so you know if if the if the the barrier to entry is now just the legal side of things um we have to solve that and so that's something that we have been working on solving the other interesting use case we we've seen is um interestingly something that we never set out to to target but dow treasuries um and the, the reason is that um the, the the same protections that investors look for for investment managers are the same things that uh govern stakeholders in a in a decentralized governance system should be looking for for the people that manage the 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 funds so um i i i think it's no secret that most dows struggle to manage their treasuries unless they fully outsource and fully tr- uh, trust um a third party um we have seen some dows um even you know giving full control and blind trust to a single wallet for example to to manage things more efficiently um and really that that compromises on the values of defi really <laughs> like you know the whole idea is it should be transparent it should be fully um accountable it should be uh, it, it should be trustless to the extent it can be and so we have seen a lot of interest in people using gnosis with enzyme uh, so that a they can give full transparency and reporting to their community at periodic intervals and even in real time uh, b so that they can um, delegate trading efficiently they can agree as a dao on the investment policy like this is what we want to achieve but they can delegate the execution of that uh, strategy to an individual or a team knowing that that team have to stick within those parameter certain parameters and three they can monitor uh, and evaluate the team um, and kick them out at any time if if they are breaching any of the parameters that they were given so um so dow treasuries is another use case that we've we've seen a lot of interest in um and those are really the the, the two the two main ones so basically your goal is to kind of achieve a user experience that is good enough that people are no longer willing to sacrifice on security just to kind of make it workable. Yeah. And I'd say that the customer the, the user experience uh, work is largely coming from avant-garde finance um through building various services or researching the legal stuff or um you know building out the interface um develop you know developing further the interface super interesting so let's talk about the vault managers um so let's say i know something about defi and i think i can i have some alpha and can uh, out trade other people so what do i do to become a vault manager so it's really uh really quite easy so you just go to um create vault on our app um and then you get um taken through um basically eight pages of questions of configuration you know for example what do you want your vault to be called what do you want the token symbol of your vault to be do you want the shares to be transferable do you want to have a management fee a performance fee entrance fee exit fee do you want to have risk management policies built in do you want to have rules around investments do you want to have rules around redemptions if so what are they specify them um and so just dro- easy drop down uh, menus which are easy to interact with and the last step is check your check your configurations and um deploy to the blockchain is one transaction to deploy your vault on chain once you've deployed it you then have an interface where you can manage all your defi assets simply from one single unified interface 
um, your positions are aggregated in the interfaces, updated in real time, and you can um, build on top of that like various strategies without having to log in, log out of different uh, protocols. Uh, you can because you know we're we're collect we we're, we're connected with other protocols at a smart contract level. You can actually just uh, stay logged in once with your MetaMask wallet and do all your trading with the different protocols from one place. Um, you can also do this programmatically uh, through our SDK or through writing a bot. Um, you can delegate trading to someone on your team if you if you are a bigger company, for example, or or more people. If you let's say you have assign you give three three people on your team trading permissions, you can assign different permissions and risk policies to each person. Uh, depending on what they are and aren't allowed to do. So the, the level of configuration um, gets quite granular. And the advantage there is really that um, you don't have to build an infrastructure from scratch yourself. You can focus on building on something that has been on mainnet for three and a half years and somewhat um, battle tested. Um, it's received God knows how many audits in three and a half years. So through some of the, the largest auditors in the space, uh, Chain Security, Open Zeppelin, and others. And then also you save a lot of money and, folk, and time and energy by not having to build and maintain um, infrastructure. Uh, something that we've learned in our long time in this space is building is almost the easy part. Maintenance is really where it gets um, painful and difficult. Yeah, amen to that. Um, so that sounds, that sounds um, incredibly powerful. Um, but also incredibly um, expensive to deploy. So basically, if you have granular permissions management on a smart contract level, um, how, how does that play out in terms of gas? On Ethereum, I don't have any stats for you right now. Uh, I would say that obviously the more granular the permissions are, the more expensive it becomes. Um, but I suppose that we now that we have other deployments, uh, we have an alternative Uh, deployment other than Ethereum, we're sort of less concerned by that because uh, the, the the idea is that hopefully in in future years will will be deployed on much cheaper and more efficient chains as well, like maybe Gnosis Chain or Aurora uh, Chain or um, one of the parrot chains on Polkadot. And so increasingly, we we think we're you know we'll move towards an interoperable world somehow. Um, and we will. This will become less and less of a problem. But yeah, of course, it does add to the complexity today. Of course, it's much less of a problem. I was shocked yesterday doing transactions. At how cheap gas has become. It's become super cheap. Of... So it, it it made me want to stock up on like ENS names and stuff. I actually thought there was a mistake in the estimator for a second, um, because I don't remember the last time I saw I saw gas prices that low and. Um, I almost couldn't believe it, but yeah, I mean, comparing from where we were a few months ago, um, it's not a huge issue today, but we all know that it's not uh, sustainable, you know, if, if, if gas prices spike on Ethereum again. And that was something that was quite prohibiting actually um, during um, during the months where gas spiked. It, you know, really, um, it did become very expensive to use Enzyme and it did paralyze trading activity uh, to a large degree. Yeah, that uh, I think, Uh, lots of people on mainnet have have felt that. So, if you look at the vaults themselves, so basically you you just said that the integrations are on a smart contract level. That that's that sounds great limiting in terms of integrating other protocols. Has this been an issue for you? Yeah, to a degree. I would say it's limiting in a sense that we cannot always meet the the needs of. Um, everyone um, in terms of, you know, when we're talking to a, a prospect that wants to use Enzyme and they say, well, we need to interact with these 10 protocols. We might have eight of them, but we're missing two. And um, although we can usually turn around the integrations pretty fast, um, you know, some people prefer to have the full, um, full available options at all times. And this was especially the case during um, you know, the, the yield parties uh, that we saw a few months ago when, you know, a new protocol would launch and there was a yield farm that was 400% for a day or two and you had to be really quick to get in to get that 400% for the first few days and then it would fall quite drastically and obviously we cannot move that fast. But um, on the plus side, I think it's those protocol, it, it, it's those um, integrations in that system and that pricing mechanism that also enables us 
to keep the trustless promise, to be able to go, give the 24-7 reporting and to, to be able to build a purpose-built asset management tool um, that really considers the needs of, I mean, if you look at, for example, uh, the, the 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 platforms like Gemini or other asset management platform, what what Gemini has done with Bitria, for example, they have seventy five assets, crypto assets in their universe that hedge funds can interact with, um, which is you know I think a quarter of what we have. So it's not that we are, um, it's not that we cannot provide a variety of assets, but yes, we cannot provide everything because every every time we add something, we have to think about the risks that this would introduce to the pricing of the vault, to the um, attack vectors, to the and to the risk management policies in particular. The 24-7 reporting, I assume this, I mean, this can't happen on chain, right? So basically you, you have to have like a, a back end service somewhere that kind of, you know, runs the subgraph, uh, the subgraphs that you have for people. Yeah. Um, who, who runs these? So, um, yeah, I mean, basically, like the sub what the subgraphs do is collect emitted data from the contracts. Um, and we have all of that emitted data collected on seven different subgraphs. And then uh, Avantgarde will run uh, a service um, that basically we have two types of pricing. We have the on chain pricing, which we get from the chain link historical prices. And we have something that gives much more granular tick data, which is centralized. Um, and I think we use Crypto Compare for that. Um, so Sebastian on our team is one of our CTOs. He has, um, yeah, I think, I think, I'm not sure if this is still the case, but at one point we were the largest consumer of the graph in terms of data. Um, and uh, he's actually now also on the graph council. And he's he's been a very big, like influencer in terms of how the graph has actually developed its subgraphs to be more scalable, to be able to handle larger amounts of data um, for us. In terms of the actual specifics of how it works uh, on our end, I wouldn't be able to go into details, but that's kind of at a high level. I mean, even even um, at a glance, I mean, kind of having 24-7 reporting on any on, on-chain vault, I mean, this is, it's... Um, this is basically unheard of. I actually, I know, I I know um, funds that kind of take screenshots of like their D Bank or Zapper uh, mm. portfolios at certain points to use this as a basis for reporting. So, kind of just having this as a continuous service. Have you thought about kind of just selling this on its own? Because <laughs> yeah. I think people would eat it up. Yeah, I mean, we think the full package is really what's attractive. But yeah, increasingly, we're, th we're starting to think about where these kind of things could get interesting. Wh where else, you know, like we can we can use this infrastructure that we've built to um, improve the experience of other asset managers um, in DeFi and beyond. So um, let's go back to the to the vault operator. Um, so I, I'm putting on my vault operator hat again. Um, so now I've created this vault and I've deployed strategies. Um, how do I make this known to people? So how do they find me? So um, I mentioned this um, white label product that we're in beta testing right now. And the cool thing about that is like one of the pushbacks we've had from managers is I don't like um, I don't like um, sending the enzyme link to my vault to my investors because then they get to see my competi competition. <laughs> Which is kind of funny because we're trying to advocate for transparency as well. Um, but I, I kind of also see the, 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 I can see both arguments, right? I mean, the data is there for any investor who wants to see this is like a big, you know, the enzyme map is like the big master database of all the funds that exist on all the vaults that exist on enzyme. But um, so there's two different ways as um, a you know, hosting your own, uh, having your own website and being able to send that to your own network of investors. And B, you can just uh, get the visibility from the Enzyme app, from the Enzyme community. Um, and something that we want to do in future is actually help accelerate managers. So we're working on a project which is still in stealth mode, which we'll hopefully announce um, in Q4 this year, which will be really pivotal to helping managers beyond just the tech, but also in a much more holistic way, 
um, whether that be um, on the legal side, on the fundraising side, on the marketing side, everything. Um, and really the vision, going back to the vision, is that we want to promote transparency and simplicity for asset managers um, and investors. So, you know, that, that goes beyond just having tech. You know, tech solves a lot of problems, um, but we really, you know, the problem in traditional finance, the problem in even centralized finance, even in crypto, is, um, you know, setting up a, a, a crypto fund today you still need a custodian, you need a fund administrator, you need a lawyer, you need several lawyers, you need to research a ton of different service providers, you need to understand the fee structures, you need to do months and months of really boring, really painful paperwork, you need to, um, even even when you're halfway through, usually you think, oh shoot, um, there's a better way to do this, and you start again from scratch, and it's just like there's no one-stop shop that can help you from start to finish. It's, you know, something that AngelList has done very well for venture funds, for example, just does not exist for hedge funds today. So I think that um, I think our our vision really eventually is to be able to uh, be that one stop shop at the avant garde finance level for investment managers. Um, you know, to to be able to just have everything they need in a in a very easy, simple, quick way. So you're in close contact with um, several of the vault managers to kind of hear their pain points. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> cool. Um, so the see, is, is, I, I kind of I understand um, how the vault uh, manager operates. Um, how I mean, you already kind of alluded to this. So there's a management fee, or the management fee can be set, and the performance fee can be set, and so on. Do you have any idea of um, how much money the vault managers typically make on a vault? I don't have like aggregate data, but there's like, um, I, I know that there was a vault manager we were looking at last year um, who, who really has been a very kind of exceptional example and a really, prof you know, one of the really has done really well, has done really well through bear markets and bull markets. And so we got a lot of our attention as a team. And, um, you know, we're almost like, you know, some of us have even invested in, in that vault ourselves but i think you know the the interesting thing about him is that at one point um i think you know last year's um fees for him were looking kind of north of four hundred thousand dollars um which i think you know on a i think it was a two million dollar one and a half to two million dollar assets under management um you know that was a function of him a performing really well like having picked up the right assets in the bear market um and b um, you know, his fees were actually very reasonable, but his just performance has been really consistent and really solid. And even now, you know, every now and then, I always, when there's a big move in the market, I always like to go and look into that vault to see what's, or I have two or three vaults, which I, I really, I like their styles. And I love to go into those vaults and, and just look at, did they, did they, you know, did they get out, like before the last sell-off, you know, did they, did they go into stable coins or did they... Did, did they, you know, reduce their risk or did they, or before, if there's a big spike, I like to see if they bought volatile assets to, and if they, you know, and it's, it's really interesting actually to have all that data at your fingertips. And, um, and that's why, you know, as we start to discover more and more of these, these talented people and we build bigger and bigger data sets on them, I think the next step is, is really trying to help them succeed. You know, our, our, Vision has always been about um, related to lowering barriers to entry, democratizing access to to finance, but that also it doesn't just come with investors. It also comes with investment managers. If if you look at the largest hedge funds in traditional finance today, they are all the biggest hedge funds. Really, the, the, you know the, the the biggest hedge funds are the only ones who are allowed to succeed. They don't have particularly good performance. If you look at the new players coming into the market, there's hardly any. Um, even if they're performing much better, they just they they often have to shut down because they're not able to scale in order to cover the costs, and so it's it's actually very hard for new incumbents to break through. And I think our our hope is that by lowering barriers to entry and providing this one stop shop simplicity transparency to all, we can help uh, enable innovation at the investment management side and success. So we really we really hope that that feeds through to investors too because that means that they don't have to you know they have a, they have better alternatives than whatever the you know the, the three or four options are available today thread, thread needle fidelity etc 
which which are just I'm, you know not particularly bad but we don't know that they're the best because we don't they don't really have any real competition i see that on the flip side the transparency that you um enable is that also dangerous to the vault managers because basically everything is inherently on chain and basically all trades can be seen in real time so what would prevent me from creating um Uh, a bot that kind of has rep just replicates a popular vault but uh, takes half the fee yeah no i think that's a, a a fair point i think privacy is probably an area that we want to research at some point we don't see it as a huge problem today um but you know exploring how we can use obfuscation layers to make certain parts of a portfolio only visible to certain permissioned people um, is is important like you don't want your competitors being able to see what you do um, we are also able to um, funds are vaults are, and funds are also able to negotiate prices off chain with people from a vault um, and then settle on chain so um, you know through something like a zero x adapter you can actually settle uh, trustlessly through that vault as true through that um, adapter but um, nobody really needs to know about the trade until after the fact. But yeah, there are definitely some challenges. I think they come more when you, um, th th they're likely to become a bigger problem as track records become longer and people are more convinced that someone is a really good performer and also um, as, as, as some of these uh, products really start to scale. You guys have a token. It's still called MLN, as in melon. Um, what does the token do? So the, the, the protocol has a fee embedded in it. Um, it's, um, uh, it's a 25 basis point fee. Um, and it's, MLN is used to pay the fee. The, the, the initial fee that is collected is as, as a share of the vault. But the, the enzyme DAO doesn't want to end up with lots of, we actually would like to end up with lots of different shares of all the vaults. But um, the 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 problem would then be redeeming all of those shares and convert you know and doing something meaningful would just be too gas intensive and labor intensive. So the the system that we devised instead was um, that you can buy back your vault shares at a fifty percent discount by paying your fees in MLN. Um, and so the, the 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 token is used for paying fees on the network um, and enables you to a discount. On the flip side, um, the protocol mints up to 300,000 new MLN tokens every year, and those tokens are used to incentivize developers um, around the Enzyme ecosystem uh, to build cool things uh, and useful things, more than <laughs> cool and useful things um, that will help improve and grow uh, Enzyme. And this is also how Avant-Garde Finance is, is financed? Yeah, I mean, uh, Avant-Garde Finance has actually contracted some of the uh, council work, uh, and that's that's that is, uh, partly paid in MLN. Um, and uh, but we also, um, because we we're building sort of other services on top of Enzyme at some point, those some of those might be monetizable. Um, there's also some equity VC funding uh, at the Avant-Garde Finance level, uh, so. We consider Enzyme as one of our clients, but we hope in future that we will have um, many more clients. You just said council and Enzyme. Basically, if you look towards this path of decentralization that a lot of um, original DeFi projects are on, Enzyme is uh, at the very spearhead of that move movement. So um, tell us about... Um, your path to decentralization and what the council does and how the governance looks. I think we were the first DeFi protocol in history to decentralize our governance. It was in February uh, 2019. So, so it had never really been done before. And we, I think, wrote one of the first, um, you know, proposals for how decentralized governance should look like in practice and actually implemented it. So the way we did it is um, Melonport selected uh, Melonport, the company that built V1 of Enzyme, uh, selected an initial starting council. I think it was composed of 11 people at the time, um, but the requirements were that all of those people had to be technically skilled or user representative. 
We couldn't actually have user representatives at that time because we didn't have users, so we just kept it technically representative, um, technically skilled, sorry. Um, and we included people like um, people who had audited Enzyme in the past or had interacted with Enzyme quite extensively at a contract level. Um, and so we had um, 11 people who had some kind of technical expertise to contribute to the council. And then from then on, they were going to decide on how the council grew from there on. We did eventually add the user representatives and um, we have uh, had some changes on the council. I think we're 14, 15 people today. Um, but uh, in general, I'd say that the really key area, I think, of differentiation that we have compared to other uh, governance models that I see is that it's not a token holder governance. And we got some pushback at the time for that, like saying this isn't really decentralized because it's not token holder governance. Um, but we actually felt that it was because the, 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 the parties on the council have to be known. Um, anyone um, who meets the criteria is eligible to join uh, and become a member of the council. You just have to prove that you're either technically skilled or that you're uh, able, uh, you meet the criteria of being a user representative and are nominated by the user representative, by other users. So I think, um, the, you know, the tokenomics like really, the tokenomics really looks after the token holders and the um, the security and future development of the protocol, but no one in, in, in our governance ecosystem, nothing or nobody in our ecosystem was really covering the most important stakeholder, which was the users themselves. And when we thought about what do the users need in terms of their representation, we decided that that would be, you know, people who know what they're voting on um, in terms of contract upgrades and technical decisions in general, which is what the governance really looks after. Um, and that they have to have some representation to prevent the council from doing things they want to do rather than things that the users want to do. And we think that that has been a good um, balance, but it hasn't been without its pain points. I mean, governance, decentralized governance is definitely um, much more challenging than when you run a centralized you know, company. Um, I think that you guys will be finding that out soon. <laughs> uh, um, and, um, but I think... Um, but I think we've learned a lot from that and we've tried to iterate our governance along the way. For example, um, you know, uh, getting people to to vote or participate can be you know, in a timely manner can be quite challenging. Everybody's really busy and has other obligations and voting. Frankly, it's, it's a time consuming thing. You know, you have to go and get your ledger, I'll get in, look up, check the votes. It's the tooling around checking the votes is not, you know, the most easy, it's getting much better now, but it's not the most easy to to uh, decode function data and, and, and actually decide to, to you know, to, to be able to see what, what you're voting on. I think Gnosis just released some tools that make it much easier. But, you know, in the past, you know, we're talking three, you know, we're talking more than three years ago now, three and a half years ago, um, it's been very challenging. And um, some of the things that we found or we learned were that um, it's very easy to add people to a DAO. It's, it's harder to remove people from a DAO, especially when they know each other. And so um, we decided that we, we should introduce minimum participation levels and measure KPIs of various participants. And rather than make it, uh, uh, you know, a kind of emotional decision, make it much more quantitative and say, well, if this person hasn't attended more than X meetings or hasn't participated in more in X votes and hasn't uh, contributed certain number of expected hours, um, then the decision to remove them should be almost automatic. And so that that's kind of one of the iterations or an example of one of the iterations that we made. Again, collecting that data is still a challenge and still quite manual. Um, but I think DAO tooling is getting, uh, you know, better by the day. And if someone gets removed from the council um, but because they haven't participated enough or similar. Uh, so the council gets to nominate someone to stand in in their place? So what we found is actually that when we introduced these minimum participation, suddenly the, the participation shot up. <laughs> <laughs> People don't like to underperform when, you know, they're, they're when they're being watched. On, on, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, again, it's, it's another strength for transparency, right? And I mean, but where I would like to get to is that we automate the, the, me the measurement of these KPIs and publish them monthly, and we're working on that. Um, but I think, because that, that's like almost like a, you know, name and shame, that, that's like the ultimate, you know, um, 
at least then is you don't even have to let go of somebody. Usually what you what you see and what we have seen is if people are not able to meet the KPIs before we even have to tell them, they come and put their hands up and say, I've been really busy and I just can't, um, I don't think I can manage this with my other time commitments. And, and two or three people had to step down because they had to acknowledge that they just didn't have the time and the brain space, headspace for, for being on a DAO. And that's what we want. You know, we, we need people who are able to commit time. We need people who are able to contribute and add value to our stakeholders. And so, so this was a really good step. So how do you make sure that the council members are um, incentive aligned with um, success of the Enzyme protocol? Because that's kind of the, the where the token governance kind of comes from, right? So basically, I mean, the idea that people who um, uh, stand to see the most upside or the most uh, damage to their positions, they should be incentivized to make rational decisions. No, I mean, the council members are all incentivized because they get paid in MLN for their time. Um, and actually, that's been another challenge. Um, in the bear markets, those payments are worth very little. And in the bull market, they're worth too much. So how to strike, you know, how to strike, like, say, the dollar value of a council's participation with the volatility we've seen over the last three, four years has been really um, has been really challenging. Um, I think the, 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 the interesting thing that we've learned from the last bear market is that people did, you know, pe people did stand by us even when our low point, our market cap got to $2 million. I remember it very clearly in July 2019. And I think that, um, you know, the, I think they were, I, I, I don't remember the exact number, but they were probably receiving one or $2,000 of compensation a year for pretty substantial amount of work, you know, and not saying it's a full time job, but you know, the 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 asks we had from the council were, you know, were, were part time, part time work, part time, part time jobs. And um, the following year, <laughs> I think, um, you know, the MLN price went from $2 to at some point $180. So you can imagine those same packages were, um, were, were worth, you know, over a million dollars. And I think, um, I think, you know, at some point we have to actually self-regulate ourselves and say, um, you know, this, this, could, this could be seen as very bad. And so we actually need something a little bit more measured. And all the, all the melon that's paid out to the council is vested over two years. So that aligns a bit for the longer term. Um, but we need something that actually reflects the amount of work we put in. So we're now pricing it based off of VWAP. And we revisit, whereas before it was a fixed amount that was that was dedicated to each council member, we, um, oh, sorry, a fixed pool of assets, which is divided by the total number of council members, we now actually um, price it off um, a VWAP and restrike it every year. And what kind of decisions um, does the DAO make? So what parameters are updatable um, in, in the protocol? So this is really interesting. So the, the we very naively when we when we um, launched uh, the DAO, um, we thought oh, there's only three responsibilities the council has: it's um, upgrading, uh, overseeing the upgrade of the the any contracts. So when we signal a new upgrade, they have to verify things like that the contracts that we deployed are the contracts that were actually audited, or that if we're adding an asset to the universe. Um, Asset universe, they have to check that the price feed that's linked to the asset is the right price feed and um, being calculated uh, against the the right, the correct rate asset. So, um, if it's gnos gnosis, um, you know, we need to make sure that we're 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 reflecting correctly if it's priced against ETH or USD, so that there's no miscalculations in the NAVs, etc. Um, so these are just a couple of examples, but that's quite a lot of work to check when you're, you know, there's a standard operating procedure for every type of decision, adding a new adapter, adding a new curve pool, adding a new, um, but, but you know, these, these are quite thorough checks that need to happen. And then the second kind of um, thing that the, the, the council has power over is fees. So um, the moment we mentioned that the fees on the protocol are 25 basis points per annum. Um, any kind of tokenomics change or fee increases, decreases come from a council level. Um, it can be proposed by anyone, but the council ultimately has um, the, the, the final vote, final decision. And then the third thing is uh, that they can vote on is, is uh, the distribution of grants. Um, 
And these are the three main decisions. I think something else that we have learned from governance is that not all technically skilled people, like especially auditors, want to be voting on things like grants or fees. They just don't care. They're very happy to vote on contract upgrade. And in a similar fashion, if someone is like a tokenomics expert, they don't really want to be um, taking the responsibility of voting on a contract upgrade. So um, another change that we're implementing, we're, in the, we're halfway through implementing this, but we're, um, we're strong believers now after three and a half years of operating like this, that there needs to, we need to kind of um, divide and specialize into subgroups and uh, delegate certain powers to, to certain specialists. So that's something that we've already started implementing. And then the, 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 the responsibilities that no one talks about, because these are the three theoretical responsibilities that the DAO talks about, but the responsibilities that everyone who runs a DAO or is involved in a DAO knows about are the things that never get talked about. That are, um, as, a, as a COO, I'm sure you're familiar with this, but all the operational stuff that goes on, accounting, reporting, you know, payments, invoices, um, you know, this is something we actually didn't even think of or account for in terms of people's time and who was going to do that. And um, ultimately, it falls. It, t it tends to fall on one or two people who just want to get it done. And you know, this, uh, they have this, like OCD personalities and just want to get it done. But there's, there's, uh, this is something that you know, again, tooling could help with because it's at the moment very manual to go back and reconcile all your accounts from the last year, mainly so that you can report to stakeholders transparently over what happened and how you spent the funds and. Um, but then, you know, there, there's things that come up, like when you give a grant, you know, should you have a contract with that party? Um, what are the, you know, giving grants without any kind of strings attached can be very problematic. We learned and we've seen also other examples in the space. Um, so you need to have milestones built in and, you know, and, and trigger points. And, and this is this is all extra work that we hadn't really anticipated. And um, I guess I bundle that all up in operational stuff. But I think it's something that people don't really think about or maybe they think about it more today but three and a half years ago we weren't thinking about that yeah so basically your, your take on a DAO um is in a way more permissioned but basically excels at transparency is that is that um, a fair way of putting it it's um it's it's more permissioned in the sense that I mean, any, anyone who meets the criteria can apply. I, I would say that in order to protect decentralization, we feel that known parties and qualified parties have to be, uh, there has to be an eligibility and a criteria to let people into the DAO. And the reason is, you know, we've seen since our DAO launch, we've seen a lot of token holder governance models. And, um, you know, we, we've always felt that that's dangerous um, because because you, you don't know the parties, you cannot disclose or identify the conflicts that they have when making decisions. Um, you have no idea around their level of expertise. They could just be voting because they, you know, blindly, and that's a very dangerous thing. Um, but the other thing is, and, and, and bear markets are a great time to talk about this, like in bear market, in bull markets, it's hard to attack any kind of token holder governance, but in a bear market, a lot of protocols get very cheap to attack. Um, if they are token governance led. So you can, you know, if, if my competitor has a market cap of $5 million today, for example, um, I can probably quite easily raise, you know, the amount of token, let's say two, whatever the threshold is to pass a vote, let's say $2 million to buy up a bunch of tokens and basically um, maliciously destroy them and, and do it all anonymously, uh, do it all anonymously. And so we felt that those risks were too high to, you know, as much as an open system, we, we try to keep it as open as we can. But I think the number one thing is having a robust governance system that is less susceptible to attacks. And so um, so the way we made it, you can call it permission, but I guess like the way I guess we think about it is still very decentralized. But um, I think the way we think about it is um, a good governance system has to be one that cannot be attacked and that can withstand um difficult situations um and those some of those situations i just listed out um we are we are immune to because a all the parties are known um they have to adhere to certain 
you know, we, we have to, uh, they have to adhere to kind of disclosing interests, conflicts of interest up front. The parties are known if those conflicts are discovered without them having disclosed it, again, automatically being removed from the council. So, um, you know, these kind of sound like boring old fi, trad fi things, but 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 they actually work. Uh, they do work. So you know we, we, we don't need to reinvent the wheel um, for everything. You know some things we can actually learn from the past. Uh, absolutely, and I think there's um, also a lot to be said for having like different approaches to the same problem, just to see kind of what what because as as kind of an arena for experimentation, almost. Um, I mean, what what we kind of see in the token holder governance projects is the rise of like the protocol politician, right? And there's also there's also the question of is this something that we want? <laughs> well, exactly, yeah. Well, exactly, and and also you know, um, without naming any protocols, you know, a lot of token holder governance. If you go and look at um, the distribution of the tokens, they typically are owned by four or five of the largest VCs. The, the you know, they're very, very it's very very concentrated. And I would argue that um, having 14 people on the council today is more decentralized than having five, five hedge funds owning 90% of your token supply or 80% of your token supply. Especially if their reputations are attached to it and it's, you can, it's, yeah. it's, it's, not, it's known generally who voted on what. So Yeah, yeah. Okay, so maybe let's talk um, about... Uh, the current market situation. So you were affected by it like a little bit. Celsius was one of your clients, right? They were a user of Enzyme, yeah. Um, they were actually our largest user until recently. They ironically came to use, uh, I say ironically because of everything that happened recently, um, but ironically uh, they, they were um, trying to move towards a much more transparent um, on-chain process just before um, everything unraveled a few weeks ago. Um, and they um, decided to do this via um, Enzyme, or a subset of their team at least decided to do this via Enzyme by launching a cross-chain liquidity product on Enzyme. And again, this 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 shows um, how flexible Enzyme is because that was a use case we, we never really saw coming. Um, but essentially what they did was they created faults for different assets, um, which they then um, used as um, proof of reserve on Ethereum. For example, they would create an ETH fault uh, on Enzyme on Ethereum. They would deposit their users, their, theirs and their users ETH into that vault. And then they would mil mint uh, ETH on, let's say, Polygon chain. Uh, I think they called it CX, Celsius uh, X ETH. On, on Polygon and um, give back to their users CX ETH. But working with us and with Chainlink's proof of reserve, they were always able to prove to their end users that the CX ETH was backed one for one on chain through chain, a mixture of Chainlink's proof of reserve and Enzyme's transparency. And um, they did this for a number of faults. And the, the second phase was going to be very interesting too, is was um, they were going to start managing the, the the assets within the enzyme vault to earn yield and i think split that between their users the cx eth holders and the um and themselves um to kind of have a win-win situation where you could be owning cx eth on polygon which owns you a yield from ethereum and potentially also a yield a yield from polygon which is kind of cool um, so yeah, the, 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 the irony is this was like as transparent as you can get and as, um, non, it was, it wasn't fully non-custodial. Obviously there was a, a CFI element in it, um, but it was an interesting use case nonetheless, um, that we have seen withdrawn because of recent events, but it was, it was really fascinating for, for us to watch that, that launch. Yeah. It, it, it looks like Celsius was moving in the right direction there. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so what, what, as someone who's been in this space um, for a long time, um, what are the breakthrough, breakthroughs you, you anticipate um, to happen in this space in the coming years? Because, I mean, it's changed so much since uh, 2015 or so, right? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know about you, because you've, you've probably been in the space as long as, if not longer than me, but... Um, I personally um, am sort of uh, a little bit relieved by this bear market in the sense that it's kind of just 
bringing everybody's um bringing some sanity back again um because i feel like the last year or two has been a little bit insane you know i feel like the the definitions of defi have been um abused a little bit and uh and and warped um and and that you know really the last year or two um has been everywhere i look has been like claims around innovation around defi 2.0 etc and actually all we've really seen is um increased risk and less transparency from from newer projects coming to market that have um i obviously don't like to generalize but a lot of a lot of what we've seen has been compromising the original values that that defi were built on so in a way i feel that um this the, you know as soon as yield vanished so did all of those projects and and i feel i feel that that's actually a good thing for us to keep building on the original vision of defi and i feel um i feel that the the recent events whether it's three arrows capital or uh celsius or um the counterparties that suffered as a result um have if anything strengthened the argument for defi you know they've um all occurred because of too much opacity i'm pretty sure that nobody would have lent money to three hours capital if they had any idea of the leverage i, I did a quick back of the calculation um estimate and I, you know uh, from the data i could find and you know i think they they would have had at least 40 times uh you know somewhere between 16 to 40 times leverage um which is crazy i mean do you, you know, I, I can't imagine any of the lenders to Three Arrows being okay with making a loan knowing that information or even anywhere in that range, even if it was the low end. So I think that transparency is something that's becoming more and more important. Um, I think people, I think on the, the, the hedge fund side, on the investment side, I think people will continue to resist transparency because... Um, frankly uh, but but also the the ones who resisted are also the ones you should be the most wary of because you know <laughs> you, if you have something to hide then you don't want it to be transparent so um but i think all of this actually bodes well this 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 these events are are actually a great reminder to how important what we're building on not just for the transparency also because of the um self custody possibility and again i want to emphasize i don't believe everyone should hold full custody of their own assets it might not suit everybody but i believe that everyone should have a choice and i also believe that um true diversification these days because everything is so highly correlated is really um between custo custodial and non-custodial solutions because if you have a another lehman brothers it doesn't matter which hedge fund in tradfi cfi you're invested in most likely you're gonna feel the ripple effect. And if you're invested in DeFi and there's a, a if you're invested self-custodially in a, a DeFi protocol and there's a smart contract risk, um, you will suffer, but the other system won't suffer. And so this is really, you know, a diversification. The different risks, you're looking at uh, single points of failure and custodial risk on one system um, is, as being the risks. And on the other system, you're looking at smart contract risks um, primarily. Um, and so, or losing your keys and and so like it's different risk profiles and you have to decide what's for you but i think that's really today's modern form of diversification um and last but not least i think increasingly we need to be concerned about governance i mean we're seeing increasingly more and more abuses of single points of failure when uh, robin hood robin hood paused trading when um uh what were they called the, that group that um with GameStop, do you remember the group? I forgot their name. Um, they caused a, sh a, a, sh a, a short squeeze in in GameStop, and um, yeah, the Reddit people. But I don't, Reddit, I yeah. don't remember what what they called themselves. I'm having a blank. But anyway, um, you know, Robinhood just single handedly decided to pause trading, probably because it was pressured by its largest hedge fund clients. But this is this was really sad. I mean, for once, you know, the retail guy was winning against the hedge fund, and suddenly. That they were they were at some single point of you know failure just decided that that wasn't that, that they couldn't do that because their their big hedge fund clients would be pissed off. Um, more recently, we saw the LME cancel the trades, um, and we've just seen countless examples of of um, you know centralized players um, favoring their own interests in order to hurt other players or or at the, at the expense of other players. And so I think going forward, you know, really thinking about 
decentralization is not perfect. It's far from perfect on the governance level, and we have a lot to learn. But I think it definitely um, has a lot of promises and, and potential for balancing out um, the risks of, of a single person's interest if designed, if designed well and if, if, if governance processes continue to iterate in the right direction. I, I, I feel your comments on the bear market. I also quite like bear markets, but obviously this comes from a point of privilege that, you know, we have certain economic certainties that kind of that that you know will hopefully be okay um there were times in the last bear market where enzyme was in dire straits as you extolled earlier any advice for people uh, you know in 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 your shoes or in your shoes back then yeah <laughs> yeah certainly was uh, wasn't as uh, easy as last time round, although last time was a huge opportunity for us because we did manage to keep building despite um, despite our really, really tough um, financial situation. The way we handled it at the time is um, we asked everybody, you know, we had a burn rate, which was basically at some point giving us four or five months runway. And just when we thought that the bear market, we were coming out of the bar, bear market, COVID hit. And um, you know, and suddenly everything kind of uh, collapsed again. We we had very little certainty and four months runway. So I think you know w w the the decision we had to make quite quickly was um, was uh, you know either we what's the point of continuing you know, during the bear market? You know, a few people um, put put in a few a, a few stakeholders put in some of their own private capital in order to keep the project going. Um, but even that was running out, and when COVID hit, the four-month runway was, you know, private, private, in, the private contributors were basically. We're not talking about VCs, by the way. We're talking about individuals on the team. The 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 private individuals were were at a limit. So the only way forward was to say, okay, we either need to cut our burn rate drastically uh, in order to get ourselves, let's say, twelve months of runway. Or we need to, or what's the point of continuing to fund for four months if we're going to be dead in four months anyway? And so when you presented it like that to the team, the team actually, there was quite a lot of buy-in and most people voluntarily reduced um, their salaries uh, as much as they could. Um, and some of them uh, pushed back and um, are no longer with us. Um, but I think um, the, 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 the solid team of, I think it was six of us that, 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 that stuck around, um, were extremely, um, I would say, like <laughs> resilient and uh, motivated, and continued to push through the, those times in a in a way that I've never seen before. You know, more motivation than ever, and um, they were compensated in 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 equity and tokens at the time instead of uh, to compensate for their cash. So I I really recommend um, you know not to be put off by a low token price, but actually. If you need to restructure your burn, um, you know, you should be selling your token to your team as a way that, hey, if we pull this off, this token will, in our case, it went from low low to high was two to $180. So, you know, so I think that the, the risk reward can actually be huge on a, on a very short time period, one or two years, um, if, if you can get the buy-in from your team to really believe that they can create the value needed to bring this project back in a bull market. And our team managed to do that. Um, so we got our runway to 12 months, and within that 12 months, we were able to close a seed round with a placeholder and collaborative fund, uh, which gave us some more time. And then later, our Series A, by then the bear market was over. But, you know, it was it was a, it was a stressful time, and um, a lot of sacrifices were made by the team, um, you know, to get, to get us to where we are today. So I guess... Um, I guess that, so number one, my advice would be cut your costs immediately and probably cut them more than you have to. Try to incentivize your team with tokens or equity instead of cash um, so that you can buy yourself as much time as possible. And also they will benefit more longer term. Um, the, the other thing is, um, as stressful as it is, also don't forget to think about the opportunities around you. There's going to be huge opportunities. You know, something that I um, like to bang on, for example, as an example, is if you're building something, an asset management product, um, in this space and you're funding the product development and the infrastructure development in asset management, look around and see what solutions you could plug into that are plug and play like Enzyme. That's one example, but there must be so many other examples outside of asset management where you can leverage existing infrastructure to reduce your costs. 
Um, and, you know, M&A can be interesting um, partnerships or uh, receiving, um, yeah, partnering with competitors, peers, <laughs> you know, uh, strategic partners can be very, can be very interesting as well. Thank you. Yeah, that's uh, very insightful. Mona, where can people go to find out more about Enzyme or participate? So our Twitter uh, channel is very active. Uh, it's uh, Enzyme Finance. We have a Telegram channel, a Discord channel. Um, but yeah, Twitter is like kind of the, the central place where I think most activity happens uh, in terms of announcements. And there's always a vibrant discussion happening in Discord and Telegram as well. Perfect. Thank you so much for coming on, Mona. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for having me back. Really great to be here.